The House probe into January 6th went into overdrive this week with that win at the Supreme Court and new subpoenas for Trump campaign lawyers. And now on the beat, we turn to a special segment to get at the facts with some of the very witnesses the Congressional Committee is eyeing. The interviews you're about to see, the reporting we're about to share with you, can help us all go deeper inside this investigation. So now we turn to live interviews with some people who have direct involvement in some of the events on or around January 6. We are joined by Trump campaign lawyer Boris Epstein in the news because he was subpoenaed by the committee just this week, along with those other Trump lawyers. He's a veteran of the White House in both Trump campaigns, including working with Rudy Giuliani in that tense post-election period. Tonight, I will also interview White House veteran Peter Navarro, who detailed a plan to overturn the election results that The Washington Post dubbed a plot to, quote, overthrow the government peacefully. And then later, I will speak with Dustin Stockton, an organizer of the January 6th rally, who has cooperated and provided testimony to that same House probe. We will hear from each of these officials and witnesses live tonight, beginning right now, with Trump White House veteran Peter Navarro. Peter, welcome to The Beat. Uh, I'd like to start right. with you with three simple yes or no questions and then go into more depth. Uh, one, has the House probe requested your cooperation? No. Was it wrong for people to storm the Capitol on January 6th? Yes. Was it wrong to try to overturn the election to keep Trump in office? No, not legally. We uh, Everything I did uh, was clearly between the lines. So let's get into the depth. Uh, you say not legally, which means you think what you did and what you advocated, a, a way to try to take it to the House and overturn the results was legal. Uh, since the last time we spoke, um, <clears throat> there have been developments on the criminal side of this. Uh, as you know, an indictment for the Oath yeah. Keepers leader on seditious conspiracy. I just want to read briefly from that. The fact pattern is different. Um, but I would note that the government alleges there that what he was trying to do was, which, quote... Which government, are just to be clear? The Justice Department, uh, independent federal prosecutors talk overseen by independent judges. I'll let you respond, but let me just read the... I'll let you respond, but let me read what is alleged in the indictment, which was filed, yeah. which says, basically, that he was opposing by force the lawful transfer of presidential power. You said you wanted to oppose that transfer of power, just not by force. Is it fair to say you and this Oath Keeper, you have the same intent, just different methods? <laughs> yeah, Ari, look, you're doing your prosecutor thing. How about you give me a chance to talk now? Is that okay? The question's on the table. Do you share that intent well, with look, him? Well, right, right, let me, let me, look, uh, let me play lawyer for a minute and simply lay the predicate uh, for the discussion tonight. My role in um, the, what the Washington Post calls the coup that uh, we call the Green Bay sweep was simply to look at the analysis of what happened in the election. I started that uh, on Thanksgiving Day of 2020. I completed three reports, which I'm sure you've read, Ari, and I hope you'll confirm that. But here's what I, what I find, and I think there's a couple of things we can agree on. First of all, uh, over four years after Trump got elected, changes in the legislation, judicial rulings, and particularly decisions by secretaries of state, particularly in the battleground states, led to a dramatic increase in absentee and mail-in ballots. At the same time, there was a dramatic decrease in the monitoring of those ballots for illegalities through things like a relaxation of voter ID, for example, and the elimination of signature match. I think we can agree on that. I think we can also agree that Factually, Biden got two to three to one of the absentee ballots in the battleground states. And so when you put those facts and evidence together, it's clear that Biden won because of those changes. I describe that uh, as a grand stuff the ballot box strategy by the Democrats, that where mm -hmm. we disagree is Peter, either yeah. whether well, I'm letting you answer, but the, the question is about what, the, what you call the Green I, Bay I sweep. The what you call the Green Bay sweep is trying to take... It's trying to take the results and have the House override them. Uh, you gave your response, which is your view of what you think happened with the ballots. You've also said, well, I think, let, me, let me finish. Do, well, let me finish. Yeah, but let me, are, sir, do we I'm going to let you go again. You went, and then I went, and we did this before. The other issue here is that you have tried to use this so-called legal process, Peter. You've tried to use it to you, argue that because you think it would go to the House, that, that helps Donald Trump 
not be responsible for what happened. I want to play you a little bit of how me, Donald Trump you sounded. You asked me for a simple an yeah, answer to your question. We, got, we heard you your answer. And answer my could, question. Well, no, you, because you, you agree with Peter, me that there was a dramatic Peter, if you become increase. a journalist, then you can have a show and you can ask people questions. You agreed well, to come in and do the interview. Here's what Donald I'm, Trump I'm was saying. To, I'm here to yes, do sir. the interview. Here's what Donald want, Trump was saying on January 6th. On a Take a listen. Playing field, Ari. I'm simply, yeah. We're going to walk down to the Capitol, and I'll be there with you. You'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength. That's what he said, and as you can see on the screen, the Secret Service advised him they couldn't keep him safe, which is why he didn't go to the Capitol. Does Donald Trump not bear some responsibility for telling the people to storm the Capitol, for planning to go, which you say is what intervened in your so-called sweep? I was with the boss for five years and went to numerous rallies. I never saw any violence at those rallies except for the occasional protester on the other side doing violent acts in those rallies. Uh, the mindset of the president was rallies are peaceful in Trump land. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that needs to be looked at as to how that violence got instigated and started. People like Ray Epps, for example, have come up in the news. But but. I get back to this, Ari. It's like, where we, where do we disagree? I mean, the, there's a concern here among the American people that the polls clearly show uh, that, that about half of the American people think that there was a problem with that election. I'm saying to you, and I'm asking you, do you agree that there was a dramatic increase in absentee and mail-in ballots that helped Biden win? At the same time, there was a dramatic decrease in looking and monitoring those ballots for illegalities and possibly a lot of illegal ballots slip through. Therein lies the tale for me. And I think the mindset of people in the Trump White House and the Trump campaign at the time going into January 6th was there were egregious fraud and election irregularities committed, and we wanted to get to the bottom of that. That's what the Green Bay sweep was all about. All Mike Pence was supposed to do on Capitol Hill that yep. day was send the results back well, Peter, to six battleground states yep. for 10 days. And we've spoken about the Pence piece. I'm going gonna, gonna to jump back in, Peter, because chaos I do, I do give you Hill. time, but it is Stop a back that. and forth, Peter. Yeah. You just referenced the fact that you worked closely with Donald Trump, which is part of why you're here, and you didn't see the violence. But there was extensive violence on January 6th. That's why I quoted a sedition conspiracy indictment. That's why we have so much violence on tape. And I want to say it's a chance for you tonight to make sure that you're on record against that violence. You have tried to argue that somehow that interfered. You asked me the question. I asked an answer. Let's with not the do plan. this again. Of right. Course, well, here's your boss. I'm going to play no this for your response. For here's that. Donald violence, Trump that day, and, and, and here's how he played down the violence. violence. Take a look. What we Take a look. To do. Green. We're going to have to fight much harder. Right from the start, it was zero threat. We're going to walk down to the Capitol. The love in the air. I've never seen anything like it. You'll never take back our country with weakness. They were peaceful people. These were great people. He falsely says they were peaceful. Final question. Do you acknowledge they were not? They were, look, I ran the mall that day. It's all in my In Trump Time book. I saw nothing but peaceful people walking along up to that Capitol. I did not personally observe storming the gates there, but I did. But you've seen it on tape. You know what happened. You know Donald Trump lied about it. Who tore down I just those played barriers. him lying about it. Where were the Capitol Hill priests? Where was the Pentagon and the National Guard? The Capitol Why Police were, were being that? beaten and that attacked by Trump this fans. I think you know that. that. That would be allowed to happen when Nancy Pelosi was told there could be problems. The Pentagon was told yeah. there could be problems. As you know, we only wanted peace that day. That's my bottom line, Ari. The Green Bay sweep was yep. designed to have a peaceful look at how many and you legal got, ballots. And you got some time. And you know there are other guests waiting. And Peter, I appreciate sure. you coming back on the beat. Most People can hear it up. and make up their own yep. mind. Thank you. We turn, as promised, to Boris Epstein, a lawyer for the Trump campaign, subpoenaed this very week. Uh, so this is pretty newsworthy, your response to all of that. First of all, thank you for being here as well, sir. Thanks so much, Ari. Uh, my response has been public. I'm happy to share all of the information about the overwhelming amount of fraud that happened in the 2020 election in Arizona, in Wisconsin, and Georgia, and Pennsylvania. Of course, as you understand as a lawyer, and I believe, as you have re referenced on your program, subpoenaing attorneys is a major problem for this illegitimate committee. But we'll see what happens. So... First, yes, we did report there's attorney-client privilege issues, so fact-check true. Second, when you say you will provide evidence, does that mean your intent is to cooperate, to provide testimony to this committee? 
or my statement stands for itself. I'm happy to provide evidence of the overwhelming fraud that happened in the 2020 election to you, to the committee, to Democrats, to rhinos, to anybody out there. This election was stolen for President Trump. President Trump won the 2020 election. So in the, in the vein of that false claim, I want to show you some of what you False, and, according to you. Well, the Supreme Court, the results, you're aware that the no, President the Biden Court, is oh, in the oh, White oh, House. But, not, but Boris, let's go one at a time. Your audience is a smart audience. Let's go Don't one at a time. Audience. I want to the show Supreme you on the war room, Boris, the evidence. with Steve Bannon. This was in the run-up. Let's do it. We just heard Navarro talk about what he calls the sweep, what the committee members have referred to as a coup, what the Washington Post called overturning the government, albeit potentially peacefully. Here's you and Steve. Let's take a look. The vice president's got a lot of power, and that's very important to recognize. That's a huge deal. Repeat that to the audience. I'll make sure everybody understands this. you got the buried lead right there. The vice president has a ton of power in terms of opening and counting the electoral, uh, the electoral college votes at the joint session on the 6th. All hell is going to break loose tomorrow. Just understand this. All hell is going to break loose tomorrow. It's going to be moving. It's going to be quick. Two important questions, and I want to hear your response. I'll give you time. One, Boris, was that a direct reference to what Navarro calls the sweep? Was your plan to try to force a vote in the House to reverse the election outcome? And two, did you ever plan or knowingly see the storming of the Capitol or the violence that day as a way to increase the likelihood of that? Let me take number two first. Absolutely not, Ari. I had absolutely no idea that there was going to be any violence whatsoever at the Capitol. Nobody around President Trump, including President Trump, none of us had any idea that the events at the Capitol would happen. And actually, I'm on record as soon as I saw the events at the Capitol of tweeting that any and all violence needs to stop. I'm do you remember, on record, what, time you, do you remember what time you tweeted that since you brought it up? I think it was around, in the, uh, I believe it was in the 2 o'clock hour. It's about 2.30, you, so it was a bit into it, but go ahead. Well, there you well, there you go, Harry. I guess why did you have to ask if you already knew? But thanks for pushing my Twitter out here. I why appreciate do you, it. Why do you and here, Peter not understand that in interviews I ask questions? You, you both make it sound like a thing. <laughs> I'm going to ask you questions. This I'm, is the I'm, tweet you, ask, you did say. Again, facts me. matter. You said to all those protesting, please stay peaceful, respect the law. You posted that at 2.30, as you say. Um, so I give you back the, the floor to discuss the, the first part of the question, were you on board with what we heard from Navarro, that you would kick this to the House and somehow override the results? Well, first of all, the results are the results based on legal votes. So the results, as I believe them to be, based on the 83,000 unlawful ballots in Maricopa County in Arizona, the 200,000 unlawful ballots in Wisconsin, the tens of thousands of unlawful ballots in Georgia and the same in Pennsylvania, I believe the lawful results are that President Trump won the 2020 election. In terms of January 6th, the events actually inside the Capitol, the process, according to the Electoral Count Act, there was absolutely a plan and a process for there to be uh, to, to be challenges right. to the Electoral so Count you, votes. Just, is that, is that a yes? Can I, can, is that a yes? No. That's a, that's a, you asked me a question, I'm answering the question. Th that's a, a yes. So this is important because we may run down this in a future election. That's a yes that you I'm thought... Answering, Ari, I'm answering, Ari, I'm answering your I'm going to go back with you. You're going to get time, Boris. But that is a yes that what Navarro and Bannon are talking about, that you would use the so-called Electoral Account Act and other methods... What do you mean would, so-called? It's an act. It's would so be, That's would be it's to then try to have the House declare Trump the winner. Is that correct? Under the Electoral Count Act that was passed... In, in the 1800s, after the election of 1876, the count was passed in, the 18, in 1886. The Electoral Count Act lays out a process to challenge electoral votes. Okay. There was a process that was undertaken. And you're on record and there were challenges so you, Would you be open that, to doing that, that, in, a future, that place. in a future election if Donald Trump were to run again? The Constitution, under the 12th Amendment and the Electoral Count Act, lay out a process. Now, the interesting thing is that the act itself has never been challenged constitutionally. That's why there's a question as to the role of the vice president. I'm on record saying that I believe for the vice president to have a very significant role in that process. Others, such as John Yu, a constitutional scholar, also believe there's a significant role to be played by the vice president when he opens and counts the electoral votes. Okay, got your answer there. There's also been reporting about the attempt to seat... Uh, fraudulent electors. Um, is that something you ever worked on or would support, for example, in Michigan? That's so funny. It's not fraudulent electors, Ari. It's alternate electors. 
Because of the process, again, that's laid out in the Constitution under the 12th Amendment and the Electoral Count Act, there is a process for electors to be challenged. If those challenges are successful, you need an alternate slate of electors, just like happened in 1960 when the Hawaii slate was challenged. It was not challenged successfully, but there was an alternate right. slate set. So we Same have thing on the happened screen, in 1876. We have on the know. screen reporting of Republicans in Michigan saying they received a call from a Trump lawyer about that. A co-chair of the Michigan party, the Republican Party, they're also speaking about that. Take a listen. We fought to see the electors um, of the Trump campaign ask us to do that. Did you make any call like that? I actually couldn't hear that, but he, as I, I just said... I can read it to you. Hold on. I'll read I'm, it to you. This is uh, sure. Chairman Maddox. quote. We fought to seat the electors. The Trump campaign asked us to do that. Uh, did you ever make calls like that uh, regarding what you're calling these alternate electors? I was quoted in the Washington Post in the last 24 hours. Yes, I was part of the process to make sure there were alternate electors for when, as we hoped, the challenges to the seated electors would be heard and would be successful per the 12th Amendment of the Constitution and the Electoral Count Act. So your view, just, just for the record here, is that... You could, as a lawyer to the Trump campaign, seat these electors in states where the process, the state results, as overseen by the independent courts, as approved by the Supreme Court, found that Biden won. And you would put in what you call the alternate... Supreme Court. Yeah, what you would... Hold on, let me finish the question, and you can go ahead. And you would then support putting in these alternate, or others call them fraudulent electors. You support that. You don't see any chance there that that could be against the law, Boris? It is absolutely not against law. It is actually according to the law. Now, you keep a reference to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court never ruled on the merits. It only ruled on technicality. And many scholars, including myself and others, believe that they should have taken that case, the Pennsylvania-Texas case, on original jurisdiction because it was fully within their power to do so. But the Supreme Court absolutely never ruled on the merits but as you know, of the Boris, overwhelming yes, flaw that happened in 2020. As you know, the cases were so weak, they never reached the merits. It's not like Bush v. Gore, where they had the case, they didn't even see, and that included many Trump-appointed justices, a reason to even go it was there. A different makeup, it was a different makeup of the court. Certain justices, like Clarence Thomas, disagreed and said they should have taken it up on original jurisdiction. The Supreme Court did not, and it is the full truth that the Supreme Court never ruled on the merits. And more and more information is coming out every day out of Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. I mean, yeah, there's information in coming out. Let me, let me ask it like this as well. I understand that you have the right to advocate for your beliefs and your client. That's, that's why you're here. When you say alternate electors, that's your view of it. Of course, you also understand that there are open probes, including in Georgia, that prosecutors might look at it differently. You understand that if you are aiding and abetting the seating of fraudulent electors or voter fraud, that not only is that potentially against the law, but then you also would lose the lawyer-client privilege under the crime fraud exception for your, for your client, <laughs> the Trump campaign. First of all, Ari, I don't think that you are the one that's going to be determining, or your audience, whether there was any perpetration of fraud. I will tell you that the perpetration of fraud was absolutely done, and it was done by the Democrats, it was done by the left, by Mark Elias, and others. And that fraud was perpetrated on the American people. That's why, according to Doug Schoen, over 50 percent of Americans believe that there was fraud in the 2020 election that was substantial. 47-41, again, Doug Schoen, a Democrat, says that there was fraud which changed results in the 2020 election. So, Ari, everything that was done was done illegally by the Trump legal team, by, according to, to the rules and under the leadership of, of Rudy Giuliani. We fought for the truth, and the truth is that there was overwhelming fraud in the 2020 election, and I am doing everything I can possible within all the rules, laws, and regulations to make sure that the truth comes out. Part of what you said is false, but we're going to move forward. I mentioned the reporting about this proposed draft order that may have come from a Trump lawyer in the transfer documents, according to the Supreme Court law, say to one here this week, uh, that says that there was an idea about appointing a special counsel to investigate the election uh, and have the military seize ballots. Were you aware of that plan at the time? Absolutely not. Didn't hear about it till I believe today. Had nothing to do with it. And I would caution you against reporting on any drafts that nobody knows where they came from. That's about as good as a paper napkin. Does it sound legal to you to have the military get involved? I'm not going to opine on some piece of paper that nobody knows who it came from that I haven't even read. Okay. Uh, when you look at what Peter Navarro has said here, would you describe yourself as basically on board with that plan, what he calls the sweep along with Bannon? You know, people can give different names to things. I've laid out exactly what we worked on. And what we worked on is to, A, prove the overwhelming fraud, which I believe we went a long way in doing. We had a, we had a very limited amount of time. More information has come out since. And then, B, to make sure that there were legal challenges 
to those electoral count votes. Those, those challenges were did happen. Unfortunately, the events that occurred disturbed those challenges. So that's what uh, that's what took place, and I'm absolutely comfortable with it. And finally, how soon should we expect to see you testifying before the House committee? Uh, well, Ari, we'll, we'll see. As they say, we'll see what happens. But if you invite me back, you'll see me soon on this program. Always interesting. Uh, Boris Epstein, someone that the committee wants to talk to. I'm glad we got to talk to you first. Thanks for being here. As promised, we turn to Thanks, another Art. guest here tonight as we try to make sense of all this. Dustin Stockton was also accompanied by his lawyer, Josh Nass. Dustin has agreed to do the interview, the lawyer on hand, in case anything comes up. Dustin, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me and uh, exposing your audience to different viewpoints. Absolutely. Uh, you have worked uh, in and around conservative politics and, and supporting Trump for some time, but you had, according to what I understand, a different vision or plan for the January 6th rally. What was it? Well, so in conjunction with what we heard from Peter and Boris, um, there was a frustration that we hadn't had the opportunity to present the evidence that we thought we had of different voter fraud schemes that had been kind of, uh, or theories that had been pitched around. And we kind of expected that day to be the day that we kind of made the case in conjunction with what's been called the Green Bay Sweep at this point, which is the Ellipse Rally was supposed to be like the opening argument, if you will, they were supposed to present hard evidence that was kind of the hook. And then inside the Capitol, uh, when the split happened, the Green Bay sweep started and the objection started, uh, there was supposed to be more evidence presented at each one of those objections when the House and Senate split. So it what, to, to, to back Peter's account up, the, dis, the violent disruption at the Capitol was extremely frustrating for us because we felt like it prevented us mm -hmm. from being able to um, present our case to the world with uh, all of the eyes upon us. When were you first made aware then of the so-called sweep? Um, I, I never heard it referenced to the sweep, but as we were doing the March for Trump bus tour, um, we were in communication and, and sending people um, that we had met along the way who, who had signed different affidavits um, to different members of Congress to be able to have the opportunity to right. have that evidence. So presented. it is interesting, again, as we go through the facts, as, I'm, as I mentioned, the committee also spoke with you in this investigation, that you did see those as linked. Um, Mr. Navarro, in fairness, talks about the idea that it was his goal to do that, what he calls in the lines or nonviolent. Then you have, of course, the storming of the Capitol. Um, do you think Donald Trump bears responsibility for that storming? I, I do think he bears some responsibility. Um, from an organizer standpoint, um, we had done several D.C. rallies after the election. We knew what kind of logistics it took to move a crowd of that size from one place to another. We had led people to go from Freedom Plaza to the Supreme Court, which is about the same distance. It required a huge logistical effort. I mean, medics, stopping stations, marshals, closures of streets, cooperation with you know, a dozen different yeah. uh, <clears throat> government agencies. None of that was in place for a march to the Capitol. If they had wanted to do that, we would have been happy to do that. We had the templates to do it. Right. None of that was in place. And so I, I, I do think it was wildly irresponsible to send people down to the Capitol that way. Right, which is, as we showed even tonight, what, what the president did. Would you ever vote for him again? Uh, I, I, I don't think I could. I, I would find it very, very difficult to support Donald Trump. Um, it's especially, I mean, you look at, since I've had an opportunity to go back and, and look back and really reflect upon uh, a lot of what I call warning signs that I excused or overlooked, um, I, I certainly would caution anyone against going to work for a Trump campaign. Um, and I, I, I just, I find the whole thing to be frustrating and sad at this point. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely be looking to support somebody else in the Republican mm. primaries. When did you first hear anything about the Oath Keepers being involved on January 6th, and was that a bad idea? Yeah, so there was an ongoing, that there was a split within the organizer groups. Um, the, the group that had control, uh, Women for America First, uh, who I was working in conjunction with, um, we used really quality professional security, guys who do big crowd sizes, um, they're licensed, they're insured, um, they're serious people. 
Um, there were other people who were advocating for kind of the um, amateur security, yeah, which bad, included you bad know, idea. Oath the Oath Keepers, keepers. T terrible idea. I've, I've I've likened it to the Hell's Angels uh, ending the Summer of Love in '69. Hmm. Um, as, as that bad of an idea. And so let me um, ask you, Justin, because, again, I appreciate you, like all the guests coming on, and, and you have this primary ex experience, and people can listen to it. Um, but you did previously, just about half a year ago, say, you know, online, quote, I encourage people to attend an Oath Keepers meeting, uh, get involved in the Anon Research Group. And I do want to play, again, for your response, because all this stuff matters, uh, some sure. of the way you sounded, this was beforehand, um, when you were talking about people's uh, possibly being well-armed, arming themselves. This was at a different uh, rally, but one of the similar ones you organized. Take a look. A well-armed and self-reliant populace who take personal responsibility can never be oppressed and will never be ruled. I lost all my guns at a tragic boating accident. But I have a feeling you guys have me covered. That was just weeks before all this went down. Do you stand by that? Do Ari, you I'm going to chime in. Well, I want to let Dustin answer the question, and, and then you can, of course, add to it. Well, but, I, Dustin... I, but I just want to say, I just want to say, their communications that the committee, that we have turned over to mm -hmm. the committee, that would cast Dustin Stockton, my client, mm -hmm. in an overwhelmingly positive light, I mean, uh, but you jumping you in as if he can't them, answer for himself Ari, could make him look in a negative light. What you would see is light. a narrative. I mean, just, just, you want to talk about you, the light. I'd love to well, have Dustin respond and then you go second. If, Justin, do you want to Well, respond? what you're playing is constitutionally protected speech. But go ahead, Dustin. Well, th thank you, Josh. And, and I do stand by. I do believe, I still believe in the Second Amendment. I still believe in self-reliance and personal responsibility. Um, I believe, and, and, and to your question about, you know, recently defending... Uh, people going to Oath Keepers meetings or joining a non-research group. Um, all these groups are not created equal. And uh, I, I think that continuing to get together politically and organize is important. And I, I, I really resent the, the I was going to use a bad word, the idiots who have tarnished so many good groups with their violence on January 6th. Ari, um, if Dustin and, and Stockton had his way, and this is based on all the communications and correspondences that the committee is in possession of, the violence that took place on January 6th would never have taken place. There are communications that substantiate that, where he expresses his concern mm -hmm. in the days and weeks leading up to the 6th well, I think we just, certain rogue I think we, actors I think that, that he's that referencing. Part, and in I think a fair viewer could hear that, because I think Dustin spoke to that, and I, we discussed that fairly. Um, and people may have strong-willed disagreements here. Of course, the Oath Keepers have their leader indicted for sedition conspiracy. So if you're standing by... Deservingly so. And so, you know, Dustin, if you're standing by people going to those meetings, then that's where you stand. I want to play one more piece of sound I, for your... Can, can, go ahead, go ahead, right, Dustin. Can I say one, th yeah, one thing? I think, it's, I think it's an important distinction, which is the, the Oath Keepers national leadership is not representative of every group, which often includes the local sheriff and senior members of law enforcement who do things like first aid trainings. Um, and, and so... I, I don't want to sound like I'm defending the people who did sedition um, and, and were violent in any way, but I, I also don't want to have a chilling effect on people getting together in their communities mm -hmm. and, and, and working on things like self-reliance yep. and, and being well, and final, and the Second Amendment. And, and appreciate that you're here to, to speak for yourself. The final point is something else you said. This was on the eve of January 6th. We just heard Boris Epstein, uh, Epstein claim falsely uh, that Donald Trump won when he didn't. Um, now, you didn't say that, but here is what you did say on that eve of January 6th. Take a listen. Obviously, we know what's going to happen at the Capitol and that we need these legislators to do the right thing. We need them to look at the evidence that this election was stolen, and then do the right thing, because if our votes don't count, nothing counts. Given what's happened, Dustin, is this the time to say the election was not stolen? Yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of time to reflect. I've sought out experts. I really love the guys at Open Source Election Technology, which is bipartisan and has, has been doing this stuff for a long time. 
Um, I, I think we need to restore confidence in the election system. I think there were plenty of things, doubts cast that were illegitimate, um, that have caused all kinds of problem and, and seeded that doubt. And I, I hope we can work bipartisanly to come to a solution. Because what I said there about having our votes count really is important. It is our expression of uh, any kind of dissatisfaction with the system. As long as we have confidence that we can change things but with you, the votes, just to I be, think just we to stop be clear, you conclude, you conclude that the current president, President Biden, is the lawful winner? I, I, I do believe under the, the circumstances that he is the lawful winner. I accept him as the Ari, United States president. Ari, he does believe that. And, and I the wish only him thing well. he was involved in in that same clip that you played were emails where he was expressing disgust and concern to Amy Kramer about the fact that these rogue actors like Ali Alexander and Alex Jones were being given a platform to march from the ellipse to storm the Capitol. Well, look, I will say this, and this applies to both of you as well as all of our guests tonight. Uh, we appreciate going to the source, talking it out. Uh, these are important issues. So I want to thank you both for joining us.